Good evening everybody and welcome to our Tuesday night input here on our YouTube channel for Brighton's Parish Church. I kind of dubbed it the inner room, um, wasn't really sure what else to call it to be honest because tonight is a little bit different from what we've done on other occasions and um, it's a bit like I guess a mini message um, but at the same time I hope it to be have a little bit kind of Bible teaching element um, as well as just a little bit more of sharing I guess what's going on inside me about what maybe the Lord has been saying to me or what I think he's saying um, and so I, I kind of just want to share a little bit from the heart um, and in that way I, I just want this to be kind of a safe space and a place where it's just that inner room it's the kind of inner sanctuary the, the safe place I've been able to be real and, and honest and a wee bit vulnerable uh, with you. So, the inner room. If it ever happens again, it might get a new name, but I uh, had to come up with something, so that's why I came up. Welcome anyway to this time together, and it's really great to have you. Please do say hi if you're there on the live chat and have the means to do so. Um, and if you're listening back to this on a recording or on the telephone, thanks as well for putting in the time to tune in and uh, have a listen or watch to this particular video. So tonight, as I say, meant to be a little bit of a heart to heart, a little bit sharing from the scriptures. Um, and I guess what has led to this has been a journey for me over the last, well, six to eight weeks, I guess. It started before Christmas. And I think was prompted a little bit by being aware that towards the end of January, I'd be coming up to the end of my second year, going into third, um, that there's developments on the go with the Braze Hub, um, there are lots of changes um, coming for us as a congregation, as an area, even things being planned or put on hold because of COVID and, and lots of different things kind of on the go. And so I guess it got me in a bit of a reflective mood thinking, I wonder what is next, Lord? Because what's been really encouraging for me um, is to be able to look back over the last two years and see some of what we've changed, what we've done differently, some the impacts that we've we've had in different places. If you want in the live chat, uh, feel free to put up things that you see or you're aware of or what you would give thanks to God for. The, the things that come to mind for me are or seeing people come to faith. I've been so encouraged by that. Um, one guy got in touch recently saying he got come to faith during one of the sermons in January. Someone came to faith during the Alpha course. Uh, we saw other people come to faith along the way in the previous the previous year's Alpha course, um, different things like that. I am so encouraged when people say, I have chosen to follow Jesus. And that's great to see because not every church is seeing that. So great encouragement. I'm encouraged also that um, we've we've made some changes in in some of our identity and, and things. So we've said part of what our purpose is to invite, encourage, and enable all ages to follow Jesus Christ. It's really clear. It's really bold. Um, it's really deliberate, and, and it's really biblical. So I'm super excited about where that might take us on a journey together. And as part of that, we've also said, well, here are four values that go with this, that kind of put some flesh on the bones, um, that kind of say, well, this is part of our DNA. We know what our purpose is, but what's also part of our DNA? What's the, some of the essence of, of Brighton's um, and where we're going within that broad purpose? And so we have our four values. And it's been great fun just to tune into to that, to talk it through with the teams and uh, the different teams we have in our Kirk Sessions, Kirk Session and Deacon's Court, as well as to hear people's hopes and dreams for 2021. We've also started the pastoral groupings and that's a big change for us, moving from the pastoral districts to the pastoral groupings, big changes. And there's many more besides a scripture union group starting up at Wallace Stone and um, the the input in classes uh, picking up again uh, since Murdo's time. Um, I know that he did that. Um, there have been lots of things. Belong starting in the last two years. And yes, okay, we've not been able to continue that in lockdown like many things, but it got started. It gave us a flavour of things. I was so encouraged just before um, 
we went on lockdown that we had our first Sunday morning where we had prayer ministry in the morning service. I thought that was a huge step for us. And it felt like we were in a good place as a church family because I didn't feel like people were thinking or feeling not sure about this, Scott, because I remember two years ago and I was asking you to respond to the word and I did some things that were a wee bit out there, even for me, to be honest. Um, and a few of you were, probably a lot of you were about like, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> but year, a year on, you allowed me to lead you into prayer ministry. And about six or seven people came forward that morning to be prayed for in the morning service about some really personal things. And that's just amazing. Amazing. And there's much more besides. Um, you can feel free, as I say, to put some things up in the live chat that's encouraged you. So I kind of been reflecting a little bit on the last two years and thinking about some of what's been achieved. But there was a growing sense within me that there's something else around the corner. And yes, we've done all these things. Yes, we've seen huddles start uh, an initiative through the discipleship team. And you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. So listen out for huddle. Um, but my sense was there was something more that and there's more around the corner for us as a congregation. And part of what I want to share tonight is around that. Uh, this is unscripted uh, other than some bullet points and notes. Um, so we'll see what comes. But before we get into that, and before we turn to God's word, let's pray. Okay, let's pray together. My God and Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for all that we've seen of you in the last two years. That even in the midst of lockdown and a pandemic, Lord, you've been at work in us and through us. And before this time, Lord, before this season, you were at work in ways that were, were great and so worthy of praise. And so we want to lift our voice up and glorify you and give you the thanks and the honour. But Lord, we're on a journey. We're on a journey together. That's part of one of our values of, of being family, a community journeying together towards wholeness. And Lord, we're never complete this side of heaven. So there's always more. There's always a next step. There's also always something around the corner. So as I share, Lord, and from your word and what you've been, I think, saying to me, Lord, give us ears to hear you, not me, help us to hear you. As John said, uh, uh, John the Baptist, may the speaker decrease and Jesus of Nazareth increase. But we do say and, and pray all this for his glory and in his name. So if you will, turn with me in your Bible, whether hardback or electronic, uh, to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Uh, prior to this point, the church has been going through phenomenal growth. Um, Peter's had that vision uh, at, at Cornelius' house. This led him to Cornelius' house. Uh, the church has grown. Um, Peter's miraculous escape from prison. Barnabas and Saul have been sent off on a missionary journey and they've seen God do incredible things and the church has grown in different places. And, and then they, they come back um, to, um, to Antioch and um, they've spent quite a bit of time there. And so in chapter 15, verse one, we read this. <clears throat> Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And if you've been reading through Galatians, you'll start to get your antennae uh, picking up here in our New Testament reading plan. Anyway, verse 2. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way and as they travelled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. 
This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. And then we're going to jump on to verse 24. Prior to this, in the in-between time, they've done a report and there's been lots of debate and conversation. Um, and then um, James uh, gets up and, and he, he says in response to this that uh, he thinks they should do certain things and say certain things to the believers in Antioch and other, uh, other areas who have come from a Gentile background. And so they decide to write a letter and what we're about to read is part of that letter. Verse 24. We've heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. And then they detail some things and say farewell and send these gentlemen off back down to Antioch with the letter. And it brings great encouragement to the people if you read on into verses 30 and 31. So, Amen. And thanks be to God for this reading from his word. I came across um, this passage as I was reading a book about discerning the will of God together. It's by a lady called Ruth Haley Barton. And I'd encourage you to have a look at it. It's a phenomenal read, a, quite a revolutionary way really of doing a discernment as a congregation. A lot to share, not something you could implement straight away. I think it would take some time, months if not years, to get to that place as a community where you could put it fully into practice. But it gave me quite a few food for thought, quite a bit of food for thought. And she points out in our book that, that in this passage, uh, that circumstances arise which God utilizes for the furtherance of his mission, for the spread of the gospel, for the building up of his church. And it arises in the midst of, of a very difficult situation, even conflict, uh, and yet it's used and, and it's in the midst of that and trying to decide how to respond and what's next, what's the right way. We were thinking about um, in Jim's uh, preaching on Sunday, what is the way of Jesus? They were trying to think, well, what is the way of Jesus for these Gentile believers? And so they discuss and I presume they pray as well, because in their letter, and um, I think it, it's also there in the earlier passage which we skipped over, um, we get this, these words, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. I just think that's incredible what they say. They have a real sense that the Holy Spirit was teaching them, leading them in that way, um, in the way of Jesus and, and guiding them in that moment. And, and Ruth Halle Barton uh, says that we come across many situations in, in life, in church life, where something arises and we discuss and we pray and we wrestle about it and, and in the midst of that God does something. That we might discern the mind of Christ together and, and move forward in his way and into his purposes for us. And my sense is that we are coming into a season of trying to discern some of that, or at least I am. Um, but I think it will involve many of us, or that it should involve many of us. I'm not quite sure what that will look like or be like, um, but I'm excited about it. I, I was listening to a podcast uh, when out walking Hector, um, I think maybe during my Christmas break, and uh, it's a, a leadership podcast, uh, really helpful. Uh, but actually, this particular episode was from uh, early on in the pandemic, um, maybe the summertime, I'm not exactly sure, uh, maybe June, July time. But in that podcast, um, 
the speakers talk about how even at that stage, the pandemic was what they called an accelerator and a revealer. An accelerator and a revealer. And what they were meaning by that was um, the onset of the pandemic has accelerated certain claims. For example, it's accelerated the use of Zoom and virtual communication. Um, it has accelerated um, issues with um, within the NHS or within as as, as a nation um, and even as a, as a world. It has accelerated um, within the, the church uh, changes too that we've went online and I can remember having conversations with our IT I say well we'll eventually get to that in four or five years time and not knowing what was around the corner and I'm sure you can think of other things that have been accelerated if you want put it up in the live chat it's also been a revealer it has uh, revealed where we've maybe put our trust and has it for the church has it really been in, in God or has it only been in the good times um, it has maybe revealed um, the, inst the insecurity of, of life or the fragility of life it's maybe revealed um, just how insecure certain structures are within our nation and across our nations so much has been accelerated and revealed and again if, if there are things revealed um, that could pop up for you and um, please do again share it in the live chat and, and what Barton was saying and what these folks were saying in the podcast and um, I think tie together up in Acts chapter 15 here that things are, are revealed um, for for the church here um, revealed that there's that there's a, a kind of change needed um, it's it's really interesting that in Acts chapter 10 the disciples already knew that things were permitted and certain practices were to be were to go and uh, when uh, Paul Peter um, got that revelation from God by the Holy Spirit and went to Cornelius's house and, and the Gentiles came into the faith um, things have been revealed but I'm not sure exactly how much changed. Yes, Paul and Barnabas went, went out, but they hadn't pinned down, they hadn't made some decisions yet. Um, and that lack of communication, the lack of decision, the, the lack of kind of concreteness uh, ushered in some of these, these issues. Um, and so it kind of accelerated change, accelerated the need for a decision. Um, I think it also uh, revealed that need to make a decision. It also revealed what were to be the church's priorities for Gentile believers. They, they hadn't pinned that down before. They hadn't pinned down, well, what are we going to pass on from our Jewish roots to these new believers? And they were still wrestling with those things. They hadn't figured it all out. Um, so there was things revealed, there was things accelerated in that story. And as I say, this time of pandemic has accelerated and revealed things for us. But I wonder what's next. Because hopefully at some point this year and in the not too distant future, we will be able to return to worship in person. But I, I wonder whether we will seek to simply just return to what was. Um, remember that sermon where I quoted um, the moderator of the Church of Scotland and he said, we all yearn to get back to normal. And he kind of questioned why. Why do we yearn to get back to normal when normal was church membership going off a cliff and churches without children? And then I don't think it was that sermon, but I think it was a, the Tuesday evening sermon in December. If you didn't see it, maybe go back and have a look. Where I talked about the Brighton situation that, okay, yeah, we've 
I've seen people come to faith and we do have a number of contacts with children and families, but if you look at our demographics, we are declining even within Brighton's. Our membership is going down compared to what it was. Our demographic is getting older and, and is, if you look five, ten years down the road, unless things change dramatically, we're going to have some really tough times. And we're going to have to think about what are we going to stop doing because we just can't sustain what we are doing just now. And so maybe again, that's part of why I was thinking, what's next, Lord? You've taken us this far. We've reached this stage together. What's next? And I don't have an answer to that. I don't know what you expect of, of my leadership um, as the minister. Um, I'm certainly not what you've maybe had before, clearly. You're certainly not what you maybe hoped or expected for. I'm not someone that's going to steady the ship. I'm probably going to rock the boat more often than not, because that's what I think is needed in, in the church just now. Nationally, never mind just here in Brighton. But I hope within that rocking, I can also be a catalyst. I talked with the nominating committee, I think, about wanting to be a catalyst. That rather than being the answer man, I would be a catalyst, kind of question man. Um, again, I was influenced in that by a book I read uh, called Canoeing the Mountains. Our elders have read a good chunk of that along with our deacons. Um, we've not finished it yet. We might come back to that at some stage, who knows, but it's been almost a year since we last dipped into that together. But that book again influenced that kind of way of thinking. Um, and I find great freedom in that, that I don't have to have the answers myself, that this can be a team effort, a family effort, a community effort, that we all, you all have a place to play in this. And, and I can act as a catalyst alongside the, the Kirk session and the team conveners and the different groups that we have and ministries we have within the congregation. Um, and so you're not going to get from me a grand vision. Oh, this is the vision for the next year or the next five years. You're not going to get that from me. Sure, you'll get some principles and foundations, um, which is probably in part what has led to our purpose and values, but I didn't come up with all that on myself. Again, it was a team effort. And it was taken to the Kirk session and unanimously voted on by the Kirk session that these should be our purpose and values. So I, I want to be a, a leader that enables and champions ideas rather than uh, the one has to come up with all the ideas. Nevertheless, <clears throat> I do think as part of that catalyst, part of my job is, is listening out to the Lord so that both in the preaching and in other ways, ways of leadership and, and influence, um, I can be part of kind of steering us forward. Because in crisis, not just in the pandemic, but let's be honest folks, as a church, as the church in, in Scotland, not just the church of Scotland, but the church in Scotland, we're in crisis, largely. Fallen numbers, as I say, in bits and pieces. And um, again, in this uh, podcast I was listening to, they said, it is tempting to hold on to what you make, makes you feel secure and what is familiar in times of crisis, rather than pivot or innovate. So in crisis, it's tempting to hold on to what makes you feel secure and what is familiar rather than pivot or innovate. And I know places that have churches that have really struggled in this time. And yes, we all have, but in some ways they've struggled more because their ministers, their members have not been able to innovate or pivot in these times. And the sense of isolation is much greater than what we have. 
And I think folks are so hungry, much more than we might be, hopefully, uh, because we've been able to, to do certain things and provide certain things. We haven't got it perfect, clearly. There's all those things we can do better. Um, but I think this is in my thinking because this crisis makes us want to turn in and feel safe. And I wonder what happens later on in the year when, when we get back. And yes, there'll need to be a time of coming together, of being family, of reconnecting, and, and of, of celebrating that and valuing that. But the danger would be that we then get comfortable again um, and, and don't look out that we need to be looking out. And even in this time now to be looking out and, and thinking, well, where next, God? Where next? And in all of this, just last week actually, I believe it was only last week, um, I was sitting in this chair, I just read uh, the bit, I think it was Mark, chap the final chapter of Mark, wasn't it, uh, last Monday, and I knew I was meeting my spiritual director the next day, and I thought, He's going to ask me if I've been spending some time in prayer and listening to the Lord, which is an exercise that I do every so often. Um, and I, sometimes I'll maybe get a picture or I'll maybe get a phrase that'll come to mind. And it'll really help with my leadership, actually, of late. It's been really helpful leadership. He can speak in other ways, but I find most of them not speaking into my leadership. Um, and so, like the last two years, there have been different things that for maybe a three or four month block. And so I had my Bible reading, jotted down my thought or my prayer for the day as I encouraged you in the mini message. I thought, right, I'm going to spend some time in prayer and just see what says it. And he did. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, and I normally get a picture, but this time it was more a phrase. And the phrase was, it's time to tack. And I knew it was about sailing. Um, tacking and, and sailing. And I didn't really know why this had come to mind. At first I thought God was correcting me. And that's a bit of my own insecurity. That I think as a young leader, um, I'm still guessing half the time. I'm probably most ministers, even with 30 years experience, probably still feel that they're guessing, but I definitely feel that I'm guessing half the time. Um, that's experimentation and it's... <laughs> life of faith and all that, but yeah, kind of feels like I'm guessing half the time. And uh, with guesses can come wrong things and make mistakes. And I have made mistakes in the last two years. Um, and so I thought, oh, I've done something wrong. He's correcting me. It's time to tack, it's time to change direction. It's like, what have I done wrong? What needs to change? But I decided to do some, uh, Searching on YouTube, actually. Oh, we're all on YouTube, aren't we? Uh, to some degree or another. And um, you get some nonsense on there. But I went looking for tacking, because I didn't really know anything about tacking at all. But I watched a couple of short videos about tacking and about the physics of sailing. And some really startling and interesting things came up. So uh, tacking it is when the boat changes direction so as to be able to keep moving forward in a particular di rough direction. So if you're wanting to, to go that way, you're kind of tacking different angles to keep going in the rough direction, but you're cutting across um, the, the rough path so that you're doing a kind of zigzag to eventually get there. But what's interesting with tacking is you're sailing into the wind, which I didn't know you could do. Like, Sailing into the wind just sounds mental. How is that even possible? But apparently it is. It's partly possible because the boat has a keel and forces and vectors apparently apply. And the resulting is, the result of that is that you go forward. A couple of things that jumped out at me that people said. Um, you can actually go forward faster than the speed of the wind when you tack. So you're going into the wind, 
But because you're going to have a particular angle and all the forces and physics that are involved, you can actually go faster than the wind. I find that crazy. Um, that you can, and you can go faster than the wind being blowing behind you. Which I just thought was really startling. Um, what other things kind of jumped out at me? Um, just that general idea that it's into the wind, faster than the wind, um, and it, it's it's still going in a rough direction. You're keeping your course, but you're changing slightly so as to catch more of the wind. And um, because you've maybe run out of distance, you're getting near the shore, or you just need to change direction slightly. So it's not actually about having done something wrong. It's about keeping your course, but catching the wind so that you can do that and you can maintain kind of maximum speed almost. Um, and so when thinking about this, talking about it with a few others, the sense of that it's, it's about aligning, it's about God directing, guiding, rather than correcting, came to the fore. Um, because he wasn't saying to change direction completely. So I think we've got our purpose and values. We know our overall direction, but it's time to tank. And that will feel difficult because when you tank, the notes tell me, you go through what's called the no-go zone. Basically when you're turning into the wind and that's when the, wind, the sail starts flapping because the wind's on both sides of it and it's not properly catching the sail and the rigging is swaying a little bit and you kind of lose a little bit of momentum. But then you keep going round and eventually you get past 45 degrees and you start picking up wind again and you go forward. And the sails and the rigging pulls topped and you go forward in your direction with your crew and you pick up speed and hopefully travel faster than the wind. And this next season, my sense is that there's a season of ah, three months, maybe, maybe more, where we need to do that tacking. Uh, and it might feel a bit awkward. Uh, and the sails might flutter a bit and we're not really sure oh, what's happening and we don't really feel comfortable. It was interesting reading a blog about the analogy of tacking with ministry. And often the, encourage, the encouragement was that's a time to be still and be in God's presence. And you know what I've been talking about with my spiritual director? The need for retreat, the need for solitude and silence with God and to grow in that discipline. I just, how many things can come together at the one time? I was just blown away. And, and so I feel like God was just saying it's time to time. It's funny, I had been talking to the Kirk session back in December, uh, thinking, well, I'm not quite sure when next I'll share with them directly. So I'll give them their new, new Year's message before Christmas. And the message was, there'll be more change on the horizon. <laughs> and uh, who was to know that, that God would give this word, it's time to tack. That in my reading, I would come across Acts 15. That in my time off, I would listen to a podcast talking about uh, this time being an accelerator and a revealer and in times of crisis uh, we want to buckle down and, and feel safe but actually we need to pivot we need to tack we need to innovate um, and just all this coming together and I want you to know where I'm at as your minister as your leader and some of you will find that really hard because you want a pastoral leader. You want to be made to feel safe. And there are times when I can do that. I do do that. There are times when I bring a measure of encouragement. Uh, or try to at least. But we also need to pivot. We need to tack. We need to innovate. We're not out of this as a church yet. We're not out of our time of crisis. Even when the pandemic goes away, we still are faced with the situation that our membership numbers are off a cliff. We're barely seeing anyone come to faith. Numbers of children are dropping. It's going to be even harder 
younger people and children have been away from church and church groups for so long. Will they come back? Who knows? Will the adults that we've been reaching out to come back? Who knows? So it's, it's not time, I don't think, to buckle down and feel safe. It's time to tap. And we do that together. As I say, I'm not going to be your answer man. I'm not going to come up with a grand plan. We need to do this together. What does that look like? Here's a couple of ideas. Um, I was chatting with some folks recently, kind of about the bits and pieces of this. And, and, and one part of the conversation led to, to, to saying to someone, you know, if, if you've got ideas and you want to contribute to the life of the church, then get involved in some of the, the teams in, in, in the church. And um, I think that's a, an avenue. If you want to help shape the life of the church, if there's something that's bugging you, or if you see that there's an opportunity, then get involved in the teams of the church. Um, those teams, there, there are teams on the Kirk Session, uh, pastoral care, discipleship, community outreach, and up and coming, which looks after the under 25s. Information about all those teams is on our website on the Get Involved page, so go and have a, a look there. There are also teams within Deacon's Court, communications, property, finance, and a few other minor pieces, but those are the, the kind of major teams. Maybe you can lend some of your support there to help us move forward. So, or it might not be one of those bigger teams, it might be a team that reports to one of those teams. For example, the Sunday School Leaders team. Um, or it might be within, as you was, I was saying recently, your pastoral grouping. Remember I talked about this recently in a sermon? Get involved there, speaking to your elder and saying, how could I play a part in this pastoral grouping? Are there some people that I could phone or I could visit? Um, are there ways that we could be together? My pastoral grouping. Um, one of the people said, well, in, our, in, in a previous existence, uh, in time, we had this thing where we would do like a kind of trip around people's houses and share a, a one course together, and then you'd move on to someone else's house for the next course. Clearly, we can't do that um, just now, but let's have a Zoom call and an hour of fun, and we'll do a quiz, and we'll maybe do some games and bits and pieces, and there was quite a few uh, party cracker jokes, Christmas cracker jokes, but it was a great hour. Someone else's idea, largely organized by other people, and, and I just facilitated it. And it was such an encouragement to be together. And I have a sense within my pastoral grouping that we're becoming a bit like a, a kind of mini family within this wider family of the Brightons family. I really enjoyed seeing just how that's kind of growing. Maybe you could lend your time and your love and your gifts there if it's not part of the, one of the wider teams. Another idea for you is that um, hopefully you've, you've watched the video from the start of the year, I think it was the second week in January, where we shared some hopes for 2021 from different people. And maybe there's some stuff that's resonated there for, for you. I've certainly taken notes of, of things to pursue, potentially pursue in the year ahead. But you might, you might have a hope for 2021. We can ask everybody. So get in touch. Send a message to our Facebook page or drop us an email and say, hey, I was listening to this message. Scott invited us to share one hope um, around one of the values, maybe. And this is what I hope for in 2021. Um, clearly, if it's the same as what's been repeated in that video, there might be no need to, to email, but if there was something different or, or else, or you wanted to add to someone's idea, um, again, drop us an email saying, this is one of my hopes for 2021 for the Brighton's church family. Um, and again, we take that on board. And I'm not saying that we'll pursue all these ideas, um, but it's starting to do that discernment together of what does it mean to tack 
where is God calling us to tack in these coming months? That we might be ready to catch the wind as we come out of restrictions and hopefully come back together. Yes, we'll come back and we'll celebrate and we'll love seeing each other. I really miss you, miss you all. I miss that Sunday morning. One of my favourite points on a Sunday morning was around about half past 10 to 10 to 11. I'd go around and I'd talk to people and um, the, the people who come early. So if you never got that opportunity, you clearly know that you didn't arrive in time uh, for that. I'm sure you arrived in time for the service, just not in time for me going about. Um, I really loved that time. It was just a really special time. And I've missed that. I've missed that. Live chat doesn't equal it. Not everybody's on there that I would normally talk to at that point. I miss that. And I'm looking forward to that starting back. As I say, as many people are saying, if we don't allow God by His Spirit to work amongst us so that it reveals and accelerates and that so that we pivot, so that we tack, then we are just gonna run aground or we're gonna just get comfortable and kind of bunker down or we're gonna get kind of stuck kind of in that no-go zone and the sail's just gonna flutter and we're gonna lose momentum. And we really can't afford to because we have a community, we have a parish it needs to know Jesus. It needs to know that he's real and living and active. It needs to, to know the love and grace of God. And we're called into that. We're called to invite others to share that. We're called to encourage one another in the way of Jesus. We're called to enable all ages, from the youngest to the oldest, to follow Jesus and and to know what that means and to know and play their part. So I look forward to the next year, to the next two years and more, and I wonder what's on the horizon for us next, as we tack. And there'll be more tacks along the way, but we're entering into that season of tacking now. And I pray that we would have the boldness and the courage and the sensitivity that the early church showed in Acts 15 as well. And then from that, see the church of Jesus flourish in this place and the kingdom come like we've never known it. May it be so. Let us pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you promised to never leave us nor forsake us, to journey with us by the Spirit. Jesus, you promised that your sheep will hear your voice and that the Spirit will lead us into truth and into life, that he will reveal you and your way. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to the Spirit and to hear what you are saying to us as a community, to us individually, by your word and in the place of prayer. Lord, where things have been of me, just blow them away. Let them not linger in our hearts and minds and cause unrest or lead us in the wrong direction. But where things have been of you, Lord, Take it deep, keep it safe, and bring forth a harvest that would be to your glory. Lord, we seek your, your way and your will. Help us to be bold where we need to be bold. For we ask this in and through the name of Jesus. Friends, thanks for being with us tonight. I realise it's a bit of a longer message and session than normal. That's the danger when I don't have uh, notes, <laughs> more detailed notes, and I just kind of keep going a bit. But I'm, I'm excited and passionate about what's coming, so hopefully you forgive me. 
in the midst of all that. It's been really good to, to share in this time together. I look forward to our next time um, in one way or another. Um, next uh, week we'll have Testimony Tuesday, so join us then as folk share about their faith journey in various different ways and forms. We've got our Thursday prayer uh, back on Zoom this Thursday uh, as, lo- as well as on our YouTube channel. And then I'm back in preaching this Sunday morning as we continue in Philippians. So as we go from here, the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you, my dear brothers and sisters, this night and forevermore.